Today we're going to speak about Nibbana from every angle and aspect that we can, both Nibbana within Buddhism and Nibbana outside of Buddhism. The words Nibbana outside of Buddhism will be a bit surprising for many people because there are many who've never thought that there is a, Bo a Nibbana outside of Buddhism. Never heard about this, they've never studied it, never given it any attention. This might be quite surprising for many Buddhists in Thailand as well as Burma and Sri Lanka. But the fact is that there are kinds of Nibbana outside of Buddhism and so we'll also give attention to them today. We'll talk about Nibbana in Buddhism first before talking about Nibbana outside of Buddhism. And then we'll also talk about the Nibbana that can benefit us today, the kind of, what kind of Nibbana we can benefit from today. When one's Dhamma practice is successful to the degree that one has a Dhammayata, then there occurs or appears that which we call Nibbana. When we have passed through all nine Das, then Nibbana appears or manifests, or we could say that the state of Nibbana is in the mind. When one has realized impermanence, the unsatisfactoriness and not selfhood of things, and then step by step carry these insights deeper and deeper until there is a thorough realization of Adamayada. The mind that has Adamayada completely in that that mind cannot be concocted by anything. And that means that there is no possibility whatsoever of any defilement arising again. That is the state, or that is the condition, that is the state that we call Nibbana. With Adamayada, it's the final stage, the final level of a Dhammayada that leads to the transformation of the mind so that the mind enters Nibbana. That means that there are a number of levels of a Dhammayada and if as one proceeds through them to the highest or the final Adamayada, then the mind undergoes a transformation. And at, when the mind is completely unconcoctable, the state of Nibbana appears. When we talk about the lower levels or the lesser Adamayadas, the first one, the first level of Adamayata is when the mind can free itself from the power of sexuality and sensuality. When the mind is no longer caught up in these things, when sexuality has no more pull and domination over the mind, this, this is what happens through the first Adamayata such that the mind can enter into what is called rupa jhana, or the material absorptions. 
most, just about all people have minds that are very much dominated by sexuality and sensuality. This is a fact that we, we needn't do anything more than just observe ourselves and our friends and see how much sexuality dominates our thinking and behavior. How much we, how much effort and time we put into finding sensual and sexual pleasures. When one has studied and understood and realized all of the das, all nine das, to the point of a dhammaya da, then the mind can free itself, separate itself from that pull of sexuality. And then the mind <clears throat> lets go of the objects of sensuality and moves up to a level that where it is only interested in material, material objects but in a non-sensual way. This is called often the, the realm of fi fine material, fine materiality, where there's still, the mind is still in, in, involved with material things, but there's no longer a sensual or sexual quality to it. When we talk of being free of sensuality and sexuality, and then moving up to the, but to where the mind is then dominated by fine materiality. Traditionally, this is expressed <clears throat> at, in terms of the rupa chanas, the fine material absorptions. These are when the mind <clears throat> has a total focus, a complete one-pointedness on one object and that object has a material basis. But that's, we don't have to just talk in those terms. When our, <clears throat> we all have friends who are no longer concerned with, with sexuality and sensuality, who, who instead are very concerned with material things such as money, clothing, um, property, and so on, in a way that isn't sensual, but they're still, their mind is still very much indulging in these material objects. There are some people who are completely caught up in collecting things. There are some people who have this obsession with collecting a certain kind of thing. There are people who are totally hung up on art, collecting art and studying it in all kinds of things. We can see that sometimes this obsession with material objects can be even more powerful than one's, one's attachment to husband, wife, and, and children. And so there are there's a higher level of happiness than the happiness, the pleasure that comes from, from sexuality. There's the happiness of pure material objects, pure materiality, and especially the happiness that comes from the deep one-pointed levels of concentration that we call the jhanas. The jhanas are where the mind has, knows only one object, is completely focused <clears throat> on one single object. And when those are material objects, we call them the rupa jhanas, the material absorptions. And this, the happiness that comes from these deep levels of concentration is a higher degree of happiness than comes from sensuality 
and sexuality. In the <clears throat> in the Pali scriptures that we we study, there's a place where it says the Adamayada for the Adamayada that is for abandoning the first uh, the first jhana or the first absorption is something which the the exalted Buddha has the exalted one has proclaimed or has explained and then the Adamayada which is for abandoning the second jhana is something that the exalted one has explained and the Adamayada for abandoning the third jhana is something the exalted one has explained and then so on through all the jhanas how each level there's an Adamayada for the abandoning of the letting go of each level of jhana and then one can proceed abandoning each of the material jhanas until reaching the immaterial jhanas which are similar in that they're very deep and refined states of concentration but they have immaterial non-material objects and one abandons these up until the highest of the jhanas the highest immaterial jhana or arupa jhana which is called nevas sanyana sanya ayatana the experience that is neither perception nor non-perception this was the highest this is the highest state of concentration that can be achieved it's what Ajahn, it's what Prince Siddhartha learned from his last teacher was this very refined state of concentration and then eventually the Buddha was able to let go of that, abandon it completely through the highest Adamayada and in so doing realized Nibbana There's a very well-known discourse of the Buddha called the Brahma Jala Sutta. And in this, he discusses many of the wrong understandings that are common in human thought. And in there, there appear a number of misunderstandings about Nibbana. For example, there are often people who take sex and sexual pleasure as being Nibbana. And then there are others who take the first absorption, the first material absorption as being Nibbana. Others have taken the second material absorption as being Nibbana. And others the third, others the fourth. There are some who take the first immaterial absorption, that of <clears throat> the experience of infinite space. This is sometimes taken as Nibbana, and so on through the experience of infinite consciousness, the experience of infinite nothingness, and then the experience that is neither perception nor non-perception. All eight of these absorptions have also been misunderstood as being Nibbana. We can say that <clears throat> all of these Nibbanas arise from a Dhammayada. Each of these Nibbanas has its corresponding a Dhammayada that through which each of these Nibbanas appears. And so there are all these 
these levels of Nibbana until the Buddha appeared and realized the highest Nibbana, the, the genuine Nibbana with, and this occurred through the highest Adamayada. And so each kind of Nibbana has its corresponding Adamayada. Some of you may have read that Nibbana is the Sumam Banam or the utmost goodness, the highest good of Buddhism. If we read this, we must understand that it, it's speaking only about the highest Nibbana. If we're talking about the highest good or the utmost goodness of Buddhism, we are only talking about the highest Nibbana and not the, the other Nibbanas which, which other people have taken as the highest. This is because every creed and every religion has its sumam banam. All, all religions have something as their sumam banam, but these these themselves may be, <coughs> may differ in degree and in quality. So <coughs> those who, who take sexuality as Nibbana, that means that sex, sexuality is their sumambanam. And those who take the first material, material absorption as Nibbana have that first absorption as their Nibbana, and so on through the, through the other stages of lesser Nibbanas. For example, we can talk about the words having a good time. Or <clears throat> the fools have very low things as their sumambanam, and then intelligent people have much higher things as their sumambanam. For example, if we talk about the words having a good time, the meaning of this you can figure out for yourself. But having, well, having a good time has different meanings for different people. There are some people that having a good time means spending time with prostitutes. That for them is having a good time. And there are others that having a good, that being with God is what is, they call having a good time. So something as simple as having a good time has, has many different levels. Even the, the people running around in the forest without any clothes, the tribal peoples or whatever, even they, they have something which satisfies them the most, which makes them the happiest. And so that for them is their Nibbana. So everybody has got something which is most satisfying, most most enjoyable for them, and that for them is their, their utmost goodness or their Nibbana. And these pres there are various levels of this up until the highest level, the Nibbana that we find in Buddhism. So then Nibbana doesn't mean death. Some of the Foolish people whose minds are on one of the lower levels, where their idea of Nibbana is much lower, think that Nibbana, the highest Nibbana, means, means death. But this is incorrect. <coughs> nibbana means coolness, means cool or coolness. Nibbana is quenching, not extinction. This is a common misunderstanding, but that Nibbana, 
Nibbana means death or extinction, utter oblivion. But Nibbana properly means coolness, means quenching. One, one fact you <coughs> need to understand is that the, the technical terms of Buddhism, of, of all religions, must be borrowed from the ordinary terms of, of regular people. To speak about Dhamma, speak about spiritual matters, we have to borrow the language of ordinary actions and ordinary life, which is very much based on material things. And so we have to borrow the ordinary terms to create our technical terms. And so the word Nibbana, coolness, has been borrowed from just the ordinary word for, for cool and for things cooling down. So we'll study the history of the word Nibbana and see how it's been used over the years, how it's been used in terms of material things how it's been used about animals, and then how it's been used in terms of people. Um, first with some material objects, when charcoal or wood is burning so that they have many flames, when those flames go out, when those flames disappear, that is called Nibbana or when soup or rice porridge has just been cooked and it's still too hot to eat, then the cook says, wait a moment, wait a little while until it nibanas. Let it nibana first. Or another example is with the goldsmith. And the goldsmith has been using its, his bellows to keep the molten gold hot and then pours it into a form then it's the word is used he has to cool down the gold that's in its form he cools it down by sprinkling water and this cooling the gold is called nipapaya which is making it it cool and this is a word that has the same root as the word Nibbana. Or an example about animals. When in a wild animal, such as an elephant, a tiger, or a lion, has been captured from the forest and then well trained, when it's been trained so that it's not at all dangerous anymore, when all the wildness has been calmed down, then that animal is said to have been cooled. Then when we speak about people, whenever there's something making someone anxious and worried, or there's something really on their mind that they're dwelling on and worrying about, any object that makes that anxiety cool down, anything that can make them cool down all that worry is, has been called a Nibbana. And so for this reason, at, certain, at a certain time, with people who didn't have, for rather foolish people who didn't have any higher understanding, they took sex as Nibbana because sex could cool down some of their anxiety and worry. And then later there were some people who decided to go off and be hermits in the forest to live in solitude and they decided to give up this idea of sexuality as Nibbana. They gave that up and they discovered the first absorption and they said, oh, this is, this is much better. And they took that as their Nibbana. 
then there were other hermit, hermits who were smarter, who had a higher understanding, and they discovered the other absorptions, and so they took, some took the second absorption as Nibbana, or the third, or the fourth, or the material, or the, I'm sorry, the immaterial absorptions as, as being Nibbana. Up until, uh, up until the, so then they, they discovered these various absorptions until finally the Buddha abandoned all of them and found the highest Nibbana, the Nibbana in Buddhism. So then these are the, this is Nibbana in all, all aspects from all angles, both Buddhism or both Nibbana in Buddhism as well as Nibbana outside Buddhism. And so these are various ideas or understandings of Nibbana. These lower understandings of Nibbana still are current among ordinary people. These, and so many people still use the word cool in, in ways that don't, are less than the, the highest Nibbana. And so we find a very similar word used for very ordinary kinds of coolness. This word is niputti. There's a passage in the the Pali scriptures where a young woman from the Sakaya clan, the same clan as the Buddha, saw the saw Prince Sitata approaching, and this was the first time she had seen him. And when she saw him, she said that if, if this, if he's whoever, whoever his mother is, she will be Niputa, Niputa, which means is the feminine form of one who is cool, or one who has Niputi. And then whoever's son he is, that man will be Nibuto, which is the masculine form of one who has Nibuti, one who is cool. Whoever his wife is, she will be Nibuta. So this is a very common use, very ordinary use of the word coolness or Nibuti. And so the word this, this word coolness has just completely ordinary meanings like this also. And this word is still used even in Thailand when people request the five precepts, the five moral trainings. At the end of this, there's the word silena niputing yanti, which means that that morality leads to nibuti, means leads to coolness. The goal of keeping morality is coolness. And so Buddhism <coughs> has borrowed this ordinary term and used it in regards to the highest thing, the highest reality in Buddhism. But not only Buddhism, but many, many different <coughs> creeds and, and sects at that time have also used this word. So although the word is used by many groups, it's used in common by many, the meanings differ according to the experience of the founder of each, each sect or, or creed. But still we find this 
ordinary word than used in a spiritual sense on various different levels. And this, <coughs> this point is, is demonstrated by examples such as one, once a man came to the Buddha and asked the Buddha to explain your Nibbana to me. This, this shows that there were many versions or many understandings of Nibbana to the degree that this man had to specify your Nibbana or your understanding of Nibbana. Please explain this to me. Then there are, but there were some sects or groups that used other words for their highest thing. For example, some used the word Gaiwalya or Gaiwalyata, Gaiwalya or Gaiwalyata, which basically means wholeness, means wholeness or totality. This was used by some instead of the word Nibbana to refer to what they understood to be the highest thing. There were others who used the word Brahma, Brahma or Parama Brahma, <coughs> which means Brahma or the, the supreme, the highest Brahma. And this is very similar to the way Nibbana is used once again, although it, because it means the highest or the highest thing. <coughs> and then there were others who used the word Paramatma or Paramatman, which means the Supreme Self, because these were groups that held that there is a Self, and so they called the Supreme Self was their term for what Buddhists call Nibbana. But it's kind of funny that in Buddhism we take being without Self as Nibbana, as the highest thing. So we could see that all these sects and creeds and religions had something as their highest thing. Many of them used the word Nibbana, others used other terms. But without exception, each of them had something that according to their own hopes and desires was the thing they were aiming for. So all of them had something as their goal, their highest thing. Many of them were called Nibbana, even though Nibbana with various different meanings. And so this is, this is Nibbana on many different levels with many different meanings and understandings. Now I'd like to discuss something which you probably haven't paid much attention to, something that ordinary people don't have much interest in. This is what I like to call natural Nibbana. If we hold to the principle that Nibbana is coolness, that, <clears throat> that Nibbana is coolness when the fires of the defilements aren't burning, then whenever there are no defilements, Whenever there are no defilements, then Nibbana appears naturally. We call this natural Nibbana. Whenever there are no defilements, whenever the mind is cool because of the absence of defilements, we call that natural Nibbana. Now this natural Nibbana is not something that is given a lot of attention in spiritual circles because it's not something that human beings do for themselves. It's not a result of our spiritual practice. All things have the nature of arising and an ending. They have a beginning and an end. And this is true also of the defilements. That means that any defilement that arises will naturally quench by itself. So when defilements arise and then quench naturally, just following their ordinary course, 
that's natural nibbana, and it has nothing to do with our own practice or understanding or effort. It just happens by itself. It's not the kind of nibbana that we we do. That is a result of our understanding and practice. But still, this is very important because it's still in the quenching, even though the natural, ordinary quenching of these defilements, there is still the the meaning and the value of of coolness. There's a natural secret, a secret of nature that everyone should know. In Pali, it goes. <laughs> which means all things which naturally arise, those things naturally are quenched. All things that naturally appear naturally are naturally cease or are quenched. And so the defilements are included in all things as well. So all defilements which arise are also, will also be quenched eventually. But it's not, all, it's not always easy to endure waiting until these defilements quench by themselves. Once they come up, it's not, not very easy to live through them. If we just went around enduring the defilements, in fact, we may not, we might not survive very long. If we didn't go crazy, we might either go crazy, or it might even kill us, or we could. It's possible we would commit suicide. And so, human beings have tried to find ways to quench the defilements through through human practice, to do something to quench them, so that they needn't be endured. So we don't have to bear them. And this is why some people have taken sex as Nibbana, because it can help to to cool down some of the defilements temporarily. (laughs) The things we call bad moods or bad tempers, that which in Buddhism is called the Nivarana, the hindrances, these little moods and states that that disturb the mind. All of these, these are hot, these bad moods are hot. And if we had to go around with them all the time, if we spent 24 hours a day, every day of the week, in a bad mood, with a bad temper, then we probably would die. We wouldn't be able to survive. But all of these bad moods, all these nivarana hindrances, they naturally are cooled down because they arise and then they pass away. This is natural. And so we should be very thankful for this natural nibbana, wherein all these bad moods, all these subtle defilements are cooled away naturally without us having to do anything about it. If it wasn't like this, we'd be crazy. So we should be thankful for this natural Nibbana, which allows us to remain sane and, and relatively healthy. Think about it, if, if we were tormented by lust all day long, it'd drive us crazy. But this calms away by itself or anger. We spent the whole day angry. That would really be an, an ugly and horrible thing. But anger eventually calms down by itself. The same with fear, worry, confusion. All of these would drive us crazy if we spent the whole day afraid or confused. But they only last for a while and then they calm away. And any any instance like this where the defilements naturally are cool. This is the natural Nibbana, something that allows us to live and to function fairly well 
because we are not constantly bothered and tortured by by lust, greed, hatred, anger, fear, worry, confusion, and all the other defilements. Now let's look at some of the nibbanas that human beings bring about through their own practice. The kind of nibbana that comes from our own activity and understanding. If we practice anapanasati successfully, then anapanasati will lead to genuine nibbana. When one practices anapanasati up until the last stage of the practice, which deals with seeing the, the natural truth of things, then this leads to seeing the impermanence of things, the unsatisfactoriness and not selfhood. We see the three characteristics. And then the rest of the das are realized about these bodies and minds in this, this world we live in. And when we see everything in terms of the nine das, it takes us to a dhammayada on the highest level. And from that, there is the highest nibbana, the nibbana that is where the defilements are cooled and quenched completely. Genuine nibbana appears when there is a dhammayada on the highest level. And don't forget that a dhammayada means that nothing whatsoever can concoct that mind that mind where nothing can stir it up, cook it up, or affect it in the least way. That's the mind that has a dhammayata. And so remember those, what we've said a few times, the young woman who has a dhammayata. There's no man who can, can hook her. For the woman who has a dhammayata, there's no man that can can trick her and hook her. This is what we mean by having a dhammayada, the mind that is completely unconcoctable. And when there is this highest dhammayada, then there appears genuine nibbana. So the nibbana in Buddhism goes beyond sexuality, goes beyond the material absorptions and goes beyond the immaterial absorptions, goes beyond all the rupa and the rupa jhanas, then there is the true, genuine, highest nibbana. This is just a natural thing. There's nothing really supernatural about it, although this nibbana is beyond all the, the lesser nibbanas. There's nothing <clears throat> supernatural about it. It's natural, it's just a natural essence, what we call a datu. So we can call it the nibbana datu. It's, it's, al it's always there, already there in nature. We can th study this matter and make some inferences about nibbana by looking at some material examples. Take, for example, one, one fire, where the, a wood fire, where the, the flames are quenched, but the wood still remains. And another fire that is completely quenched, and there's no wood remaining. What about these is the same, and what about them is different? We can compare these two to help us understand what is meant by Nibbana. And so, in Pali, we, in the Pali language, we have two words. We have the word Sa Upadisesa Nibbana Datu 
we remet, we just mentioned that nibbana is a datu. That means a natural essence, a reality that already exists in nature. This is what we mean by datu. So nibbana is a datu, but there are two kinds of nibbana datu. There's sa upadisesa nibbana datu, which is like the first fire, where all the heat is cooled down, but the fuel is still remaining. This is what sa upadisesa means, with fuel remaining. So the nibbana where the fuel still remains <coughs> is the first kind of nibbana. Then there's the second anupadisesa nibbana datu, <coughs> which means with no fuel remaining. There's the wood, there's none of the wood, none of the fuel left. The fire is completely cooled down and there's no fuel left. These are the two kinds of Nibbana Dhatu, with fuel remaining and without any fuel remaining. In these two words, there is the word Upati, which we've been using as firewood, or Upati means firewood or fuel. But it's often translated in various ways in Thai, and it's quite difficult to translate, but it's often used in the very mundane sense as fuel, or especially in those days, firewood, because that was the main fuel used. So upati means this basic fuel or fire. To translate it as something like cause or, or something wouldn't quite be correct, or sometimes it's translated as something like a, a seed or germ, and that's not quite proper either. It's best if we just stay with the word fuel. And so there's the Nibbana where fuel remains and the Nibbana where there's no fuel left. What this means is that there is fuel there's certain things which acts as fuel for the arising of the defilements, <clears throat> the flames, the fires of the defilements, and the attachment to ego, to I and mind. There's a fuel for this. Now there are certain awakened beings or arahants. Some arahants have completely cooled down all the fires of greed, hatred, and delusion. There's no more attachment to I and mine. But still they feel some of the fuel. And this fuel is the sense of positive and negative, where the some awakened beings, some arahant, still, still experience things as positive and negative. But and so this fuel remains, but it isn't allowed to, it doesn't go and bring up the defilements or ego. But there are other arahants who are completely cool. That means that even this fuel of positive and negative has been cooled away. So for some awakened beings, nothing is taken. There's no sense or feeling that things are positive or negative at all. And so this second arahant has no, there's no way the second arahant feels any positiveness or negativeness. There's nothing that is experienced as positive or negative. And so this this awakened being is completely cooled, completely quenched. There's not, not even any fuel remaining. The fire is gone and all the fuel is gone as well. So there are these two kinds of Nibbana. There's the Nibbana where the fuel of positive and negative is still there, but there's no way that it can concoct up 
the defilements concoct ego and attachment. Then there's the second kind of Nibbana in which the fuel is completely gone and so and everything is cooled. The defilements are cooled, the ego is cooled, and even the fuel of positive and negative is cooled. The second kind of Nibbana is cooler, is calmer. These, these are the two, the two highest Nibbanas, the Nibbana, Nibbana as it's understood in Buddhism. Now we should also let you know that there are people who explain things in a different way and they, they're welcome to understand things however they wish. But this, this is how we understand Nibbana. And so there's the fire that's cooled down but still has fuel remaining. And there's the fire that's been cooled down and there's no fuel remaining. And then what about all of us sitting here with these fires blazing up all the time and there's lots of fuel. We're, we're still having these strong feelings of positive and negative. And then the defilements are, are blazing forth in positive and, and negative ways. So not only are our fires shooting up as we sit here, but we keep adding fuel to the fire also. So we're still all caught in this positive and negative. And all our, fly, our fires are blazing up and around all the time. So we ought to make a little comparison between our current situation and the Nibbanas where the fire has cooled down completely. Now we're going to summarize all the different angles and aspects of Nibbana. First thing we'd like to point out, very important fact, is that Nibbana has nothing to do with death. What, what good would Nibbana be if, if we died? If there was Nibbana and then we were just dead, it would be of absolutely no meaning or benefit in any way. <coughs> Nibbana is useless for a dead person, but Nibbana has nothing to do with death. And so it happens while still, while the life is still living. <coughs> Nibbana appeared way before any religion appeared. Before we had any religions or spiritual ideas or anything, the earliest human beings in the forests and caves still desired coolness. They still needed coolness. And so Nibbana appeared way before any religion did. Then once people had various means of, of cooling things down, then this was the first religion on the most primitive level. And then religion evolved finding more skillful, more successful ways of, of finding coolness until this evolved to the highest level as we've been describing where all the fires can be completely cooled in the highest Nibbana. <clears throat> and we've also explained how Nibbana is originally and just an ordinary common term used around the house and home. And this has been used in various ways. We can use Nibbana regarding material objects which were hot and then have cooled down. We can use it about wild animals that have been tamed. We can even use it in the meaning of certain, certain fools who who use it in a very crude and coarse way, and then higher and higher meanings until the highest. And so this ordinary word Nibbana has been applied on very, very different levels. It has many different meanings. 
or can be used with many different meanings. Something that's most marvelous about Nibbana is that it's an instinct. We instinctually desire coolness. The living being instinctually seeks coolness. If we put our hand in a fire, we immediately withdraw it without having to think because the organism instinctually seeks coolness. This is a natural fact that is truly marvelous, that in seeking Nibbana we don't have to go against the, our, our most fundamental instinct, that, we, that Nibbana is a natural desire, coolness is a natural instinct of living things. So heat teaches us to want coolness and tukka teaches us to seek the quenching of tukka. This is completely natural that nature, that life teaches us in this way. And so we ought to be very grateful to life and to nature that it teaches us, that it naturally points us in the direction of, of Nibbana. And then not only that provides us with natural Nibbana and that full Nibbana is always there ready to be discovered. Further, it's a science. This is all a, a science of Nibbana. But this is a science that nobody's interested in. But there's some, it's the whole methodology, the whole approach is scientific. One can directly verify these facts for oneself using a, a truly scientific approach. We don't need a hypothesis or anything. All we have to do is perform the experiment. If we take out the fuel, the fire goes away. In this, by doing this, we can verify the fact of Nibbana. So this is totally, thoroughly scientific, and which is completely appropriate in a scientific age like this, where we have to be scientific about everything. We ought to be just as scientific about our inner state, about the, the problem of, of suffering, of tukkha stupidity regarding positives and negatives. This is the fuel of all the fires. If we remove this fuel, then the fires cool down. We ought to learn how to remove this, this great foolishness and find out what Nibbana is. Don't give anything the values of positive and negative. This is the, the method to, to avoid all the fires. This is the way to keep life from, from burning itself. Don't give anything. Don't fall into the stupidity of giving anything the values of positive and negative. And now we come to the last fact or last truth. And this is one that we should be grateful to impermanence. We should have nothing but, but thanks for impermanence. Because of impermanence, there's the possibility of change from tukka to the quenching of tukka. There's a possibility of all the pain and misery changing. If there wasn't impermanence, if everything was permanent, then we'd, uh, there'd be nothing but permanent tukka. But, so we should be most thankful for impermanence that provides the possibility for the ending of tukka, for the elimination of tukka. <clears throat> As we said earlier, impermanence is the stream of evolution. It's the stream of evolution that we're all a part of. If there was permanence, there would be no evolution, no and no development. 
It's only through impermanence that there is development from the child to the teenager to the adult. So you might say that this is looking at impermanence in an optimistic way, which is, which is wise. There's no reason to, to only look at impermanence in a pessimistic way. Now we should look at some of our, the misunderstandings we have about the thing we call Nibbana. The first misunderstanding is that Nibbana is death, or that we must die over and over again through many lives until we can find Nibbana. This understanding is totally incorrect. Nibbana can only be found here and now. And Nibbana already exists in nature. So it's to be found right here and now. <clears throat> and then there's the later teaching, which has nothing to do with what the Buddha ever said, that Nibbana is a city or a world somewhere, that Nibbana is some city or world or kingdom up in the sky or who knows where, where, where we can go. This idea that Nibbana is some physical place somewhere is, is complete foolishness and is absolutely incorrect. We must finish with the world right here and now, and then Nibbana appears right here and now. There's no need to go anywhere, to go anywhere else. Just eliminate all, all worldliness right here and now, and then there is Nibbana immediately, instantaneously. Or there's a word in there's a word in Thai that comes from the Pali, and when people use these words without understanding their proper meaning, they get very confused. So sometimes people talk about either the villagers or sometimes even the monks in the Dhamma chairs talking without knowing the the Pali words that they use. They talk about the Uttara world, the Uttara world. Udon is the Thai for Uttara, which means, in one sense, means northern, but in the other sense it means, it means above. So the, the direction above, of course, is the north. But people who don't understand the way these words are used, when they talk about beyond the world, they end up talking about the north, some place up north up there. And so they're totally confused about what Nibbana is. Another <clears throat> misunderstanding is that, that Nibbana can't happen in this time and age, that this era is inappropriate for Nibbana, that Nibbana has no place in this modern world of ours, that we're unable to realize it or something like that. This understanding is also quite stupid because in a world where there's so much suffering, pain, and tukka like this, then there's a, a total, there's an even more important relevance for Nibbana. In a world wherever there is, there is tukka, there there is the need for Nibbana. And we've got more than enough tukka in this modern world of ours. And so Nibbana has a place here just as much as in any time or era. The biggest fools say that Nibbana is the enemy of development, when in fact Nibbana is the most important supporter of, of proper development. In fact, Nibbana is itself true development. Nibbana is the goal in, of all real development. How, how can Nibbana be the enemy of development when Nibbana is purity of mind, cleanliness of mind, when it's the calmness of mind, the, when Nibbana is a, a brightness and clarity of mind, Nibbana is a lightness and act, activeness, mind that is very light, flexible, 
and active, mind that is very cool, very clear, very cool, and a mind that is completely free. When this is what Nibbana is, how could it be the enemy of development? And the results of Nibbana are the end of all heaviness and all burdens, the end of all all bondage, all chains. It's the end of all pain, all, all tukka, and it's the end of all problems. So in short, Nibbana is quenching, it's not extinction. And Nibbana is the meaning of the peace that we want so desperately these days, although it might be a little bit more complete than, than ordinary people are willing to, to try for. But in material peace, mental peace, bodily peace, mental peace, spiritual peace, all of these are included in, in Nibbana. Or Nibbana is what the Christians call or is what we could call the kingdom of God. But God here is not a personal, egoistic God, a God that's conceived in terms of I and mine. But God is something completely natural. God is here the highest, the highest thing in nature. And so the kingdom of this highest thing, this is, this is the same as Nibbana. It's reached not by I and mine or by ego, but is reached through egolessness. And so we can all have Nibbana right here and now. If not the highest Nibbana, at least an appropriate level of Nibbana. And then this can be raised higher and higher until Nibbana is perfect. All of us all of us can find Nibbana here and now, and that can be perfected in complete Nibbana. So don't settle for the Nibbana of sex or the Nibbana of positive, of having positive. Don't settle for the Nibbana of the first, second, third, fourth absorptions or even of the immaterial absorptions, even the highest one of neither the experience that is neither perception nor non-perception. Don't, don't settle for any of these lesser Nibbanas, but, but realize the, the true Nibbana, where the fire has been quenched completely and all the fuel has been cooled as well. The fuel where there's, where there's no more fuel, the Nibbana where there's no more fuel of positive and negative left. This is to be completely, thoroughly quenched in perfect Nibbana. So having a Dhammayada from level to successively higher level will then bring Nibbana, will reveal Nibbana on successively higher levels as well. Mm. So may you all have Nibbana, that is coolness, on successively higher and more perfect levels. If you are successful in the practice of mindfulness with breathing, then there won't be any doubts that this will happen. Mm. Our time is up for today, and so we ask that we close today's meeting. Thanks for being patient listeners once again. If you still have some patience left, come back again tomorrow and we'll speak one more time.